Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nima Abuwate and you'll join us at the Middle East International Film Festival in Abu Dhabi where many of the region's best films are being showcased. Later in the program I'll be speaking to the director of the festival to find out how he hopes events like this will help galvanise the region's film industry. Also coming up this week... The IMF predicts fast economic growth next year for the oil-rich states of the Middle East. But how will the oil-poor ones fare? I'll be reporting from the Amani province of Masandum, which has got one of the most beautiful, unspoilt coastlines in the region. It wants to build an international airport so thousands more tourists can fly in to see its charms. But can Masandum cash in on its beauty without spoiling it? And one of the region's top hotel developers tells this programme that Dubai's government needs to step in to help the industry. Either we stop issuing licences for future developments uh, or we're heading for a price cartel. The Middle East is coming out of its economic downturn, says the International Monetary Fund, and is set for growth in 2010. The region's oil-rich countries are set to recover much more quickly than the oil-poor ones. The IMF forecasts that the region's big exporters of crude will see an average economic growth of 5.2% next year. But it says regional oil importers will have a slower, more gruelling recovery. Their economies are forecast to grow, on average, by only 3.8% next year. The IMF made these forecasts at an economic seminar held in Dubai this week. Jeremy Howell spoke to its director for the Middle East, Masoud Ahmed, and asked him why he expected oil exporting states to recover so fast. After a small contraction this year, the world economy is going to grow next year, driven in large measure by better performance in emerging markets, but also uh, by an ending of the recession in Europe and the United States, which will also show some improvement. Obviously, the oil demand is very much driven by what happens at global growth. But all this is predicated on an assumption that oil importing countries in the West and China, that demand there will bounce back for crude oil. Uh, that needn't necessarily be the case. Well, what that will mean is that uh, the aggregate GDP numbers for these countries in the region who are oil exporters will also show a more modest improvement. But just as they spent their way through the crisis in 2009, they do have the resources to continue to do that in 2010. What sectors are we likely to see economic growth in this time round? We saw a big, big boom in the property sector, for example. What kind of sectors are you expecting to grow this time round? Well, I think certainly in some countries, real estate uh, was driving the growth process, uh, maybe even disproportionately. What we want to encourage is a process of growth that is more diversified, that relies on services, it relies on trade, and it relies on ancillary industries to the oil industry. You'll also see public spending, which is financing infrastructure development, because a number of these countries still need to have uh, more infrastructure to really develop their full potential. Now, in Emirates like Dubai, governments will have to pay billions to pay down the debts amassed by state-owned enterprises. Do you think that this will hold back growth? Certainly, the process of working through the consequences of the collapse in asset prices, including real estate, on the balance sheets of banks, uh, on the balance sheets of corporations, is something that has been a drag on growth and uh, that will continue for a bit. But uh, we also know that these economies, including the UAE, have the resources to be able to make those uh, payments. And so the question really is that it's going to slow down growth a bit, but we don't see this as a systemic issue. Masoud Ahmed, the IMF's director for the Middle East, speaking to Jeremy Howell there. Now, film directors have been descending on Abu Dhabi this week for the Middle East International Film Festival. But how can festivals like this help develop the region's film industry? A-list celebrities from around the world jostled for attention on the red carpet on the opening night of the film festival here in Abu Dhabi. The shining stars included Frida Pinto, Hin Sabri and Demi Moore. 
I was so honored at the invitation and at the opportunity to come and, and expand my understanding and experience by um, seeing more of the Middle East and meeting more of the people. And here's one of the films being shown called No One Knows About Persian Cats. But it's not actually about cats. It's about the underground music scene in Tehran. It's by the Iranian director Bahman Gobad and he shot the film in just three weeks without permission from the authorities. His film was a hit at the Cannes Film Festival. So what brings him to Abu Dhabi? I have been to many of these film festivals and I'm not really sure how they can help. But when we gather here, we can watch each other's films or talk to each other, communicate and exchange views. It's important for Middle Eastern directors to be in touch with one another. Iranians with Emiratis and Syrians and Lebanese. This festival can tie us filmmakers together. Well, you can basically use a toothbrush, if, um, especially if we're doing the splattering effect. The festival's not just about watching films, but how to make them as well. If this looks like something out of the Lord of the Rings film, that's because it is. The movie's makeup artists were here in Abu Dhabi to show how it was done. But does learning the tricks of the trade make an industry? Now, this is just one of the region's film festivals. There's an annual one held down the road in Dubai and another that's on in just a couple of weeks in Qatar. So what makes this festival stand out? Well, I'm joined by the festival's director, Aïs al Mazrui Isa. Why should people come to Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi is special by itself. I mean, the initiatives, the cultural initiatives in Abu Dhabi, the Formula One, the film festival, I think, you know, collectively as Abu Dhabi, as a city, you know, will achieve our dreams in, in the years to come. Why come to Abu Dhabi? It's a desert here. I think Abu Dhabi can offer more than just a desert. We have a beautiful uh, sea that no one has yet to discover from production, and we are focusing on that. But also, I think, you know, the beautiful, you know, uh, culture elements that is going to come, you know, in the next three years from the Louvre, the Guggenheim, to Saadiyat Island, or the culture district, and, and we have plenty to offer. Will you be asking people to submit their scripts? Um, it's a difficult question, but uh, we're not looking for the, you know, uh, the bombing and the killing. And we want to, to uh, the production to be part of Abu Dhabi strategy. We, we're looking for peace and harmony and, and culture to be, you know, active in, in the world. Aisa al Mazrui, the director of the Middle East International Film Festival, speaking to me earlier. Now, one of the few unspoiled places here in the Gulf is Musandam in Oman, which is a peninsula right at the top of the Gulf. The government is planning to build an international airport there. But could this ruin Musandam's appeal? Jeremy Howell reports. Musandam is a favourite weekend retreat for residents of the Gulf who come to admire the spectacle of these bare mountains plunging into the sea. These are known as the fjords of Arabia. But for the 30,000 people who live perched along Masandam's coastline, living is basic and money hard to come by. Many of the villages here on the Masandam coastline don't have electricity, nor are they connected by road. Most people survive by fishing or by illicitly exporting cigarettes to Iran, 60 miles across the water. Tourism offers Musandam the quickest route out of hardship. This is the Six Senses Ziggy Bay, an eco-friendly luxury resort which opened a year and a half ago on Musandam's Indian Ocean coast. It provides jobs for 25 people in the neighbouring village. The development is designed to have minimal impact on the environment. We've used natural resources from the area, like the rocks that you see, that are actually literally being made from the actual vicinity. One of the features of the villa is what we call a summer house or a majulus, where it's all date palm uh, reed, so that actual natural air will flow through. So it's a sitting area for the guests to actually sit inside the villa, but it's actually naturally air conditioned. Six Senses hopes to attract visitors to Ziggy Bay from all over the world. The problem is, to get into the Masandam Enclave, they're faced with the hassle and to cross from another country, the UAE. How much more convenient it would be to fly straight in. Oman's Ministry of Transport has been taking bids from private firms to draw up a master plan for an international airport to be built here in the valleys behind the mountain chains. 
it would have a capacity of a quarter of a million passengers a year. And 40 firms ranging from as far afield as Britain and Japan have come forward with their tenders. To have so many more guests come to the destination would be really a huge advantage. The opportunity to tie up with airlines to market and do more promotion for the Muslim Emirate region would be fantastic to actually give it a huge exposure. Across the Rasandam Peninsula in Kassab, the enclave's principal town, there's money to be made taking visitors out to sea to spot dolphins. The tour operators say having an international airport would massively boost this business. We cannot get business from outside, no any charter coming from outside. For this is very good idea is this is an international airport in, in Musandam. We can get uh, uh, too many business from Germany, from France, from Russia, from Arabic country, coming direct to Hassab. But is it possible for Musandam to bring in thousands more visitors a year and build dozens more hotels to accommodate them all without affecting the tranquility of its mountain environment? Is it in danger of spoiling its charm as the land that time forgot? Local environmental scientist Dennis Russell says development may not be such a bad thing for Masandam. Well, I think it's even uh, more important to realize that this area may be run down and overgraze and have problems already. By bringing in development, and if the developers are ecologically sensitive and know how to do it, and they do, they do know how to do it, they could actually create uh, ecosystems such as the mangrove ecosystems that brings in uh, fish and birds and flamingos. The Maldives are an example of a place which built a mass tourism industry while at the same time enhancing the environment through measures like planting mangroves. Eco-friendly resorts like the Six Senses Zigi Bay seem to be setting a similar example in Musandam. The question is whether people building less luxurious developments would be prepared to sink in the same type of money to preserve Musandam's environment. Jeremy Howell reporting from Musandam in Oman, one of the many places in the Gulf where new hotels and resorts are still being built. But with tourist numbers to the Middle East plummeting, can the new rooms be filled? Find out after the break. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuarte and we're in Dubai now. Behind me is the self-styled seven-star hotel Burj Al Arab, which is one of the reasons millions of people visit Dubai every year. The thing is that the Middle East had two bumper years of growth, but then suffered the biggest drop in tourist numbers in the world last year. But still, hotels and resorts in the region are pushing ahead with their ambitious expansion plans. Can they fill all these new rooms? To find out, I spoke to Paul Bell from Adar Hotels and Hospitality, Samir Ansari, Chief Executive of Ishraq, which invests in the development of hotels in the region, and Omar Bin Nani from the Moroccan Ministry of Tourism, one of the few countries to record an increase in tourist numbers last year. What is it like for you? Well, we've spent the last two, two and a half years developing a, a whole raft of hotels which we're opening in the next couple of weeks. So at the moment it's major excitement as we head towards the, uh, the, the Grand Prix in Abu Dhabi which is uh, when we're getting all of our hotels open for. So for the next three or four weeks at the moment we're, we're still a developer and we're still in delivery mode. Have you changed the way you wanted to do things significantly because of the credit crunch? The rates are still very high, the occupancy levels in Abu Dhabi are still very high. Uh, in fact I think Abu Dhabi is one of the, the few spots in the Middle East where they have positive growth at the moment. The, the real measure in Abu Dhabi is going to be next year and the year after when new supply comes into the market. Dubai is a very different situation. Dubai has many hotel rooms that are available. Um, you are an operator on the ground, Sami. You must be feeling this. Year to date, uh, average or revenue per available rooms in Dubai are down by about 35% as compared to last year. Occupancy is not as bad as some people seem to think. Uh, Dubai is still able to achieve a healthy occupancy year-round of year-to-date of over 65%. Uh, however, hotels are not able to charge rates they used to charge last year or the year before. Are you downsizing? I, actually, I can say that we did not uh, uh, lose a single employee 
what we've done to, to manage the downturn is basically where in, in months when the occupancies were really low, we've asked staff to take additional unpaid leave. You're in a very different uh, market, of course. I'm a, you're in Morocco. Morocco is a more mature market, but of course you must also have been impacted by what's going on. Uh, yes, it's right. Uh, the times are more difficult, but we don't feel in Morocco that uh, it will last. Uh, this year, maybe because of our proximity of uh, Europe, we are just two, three hours for uh, the, the biggest uh, capitals in uh, Europe. Uh, we had more people coming, but they are spending less, uh, but it's a recovering. Do you believe that the industry has been damaged severely? Will it, will it be able to recover? Oh, this is a, it's a very well-known fact that uh, once you start dropping rates significantly, it takes you years to recover the rates that you charged originally because consumers don't take to rate increases uh, uh, easily. Okay, what about potential though? Morocco, do you have the right um, number of projects for the numbers of people that you're getting in now? For development in Morocco, the uh, government uh, give the chance to land developments, to big land developments of 300, 500 hectares and in these hectares, uh, there are plots for hotels, for leisure hotels, business hotels when it's near the cities, uh, etc. But uh, we need more and more hotel developers. We have some big players in Morocco, uh, but there is uh, opportunities and place for international players to come. Okay, but sorry, again, things have changed. There will be supply coming on online in Dubai over the next few months, a lot of supply. Isn't this, again, you know, a, a recipe for yet more problems for you? I've recently looked at uh, stats that uh, show that uh, in the year 2012, Dubai will double the inventory of rooms that was on, in the market in 2008. Uh, definitely, most of, of all of these projects the owners need to revisit those feasibilities. What is the future for this city? It's difficult. I mean, from my perspective, I would say it needs government intervention. It's probably not the right thing because Dubai is, uh, prides itself on open trade, but it's getting to dangerous levels whereby something needs to be done, uh, either we stop issuing licenses for future developments, uh, or we're heading for a price cartel, like in the rest, in some countries in the GCC, there's a cartels that control rates, control prices. And we might be heading for that as a, a measure to get us out of uh, the situation we're in. And how are, for you, just at the very end, you are a more mature market, but you still have a lot of projects coming in uh, and rooms becoming available. Are you going to be making money on these new rooms? Uh, it's true, there are many rooms that are coming and uh, it's a big challenge to fulfill them. But uh, we have also the change that we have diversified our product. Uh, before that, Morocco has only two international destinations that uh, were Marrakesh and Agadir. And uh, last summer, we opened uh, the first uh, beach resort, new beach resort, that is idea on the Mediterranean coast. In the tourism and, uh, industry, uh, it's uh, a long-term investing. Okay, very briefly, Paul, um, what is the biggest lesson that you and Abu Dhabi have learned and implemented as a result of all this? The key is balance. The key is can we balance the demand with the supply? And uh, it, at the moment, the, the, it's the, 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 the sort of swingometer has swung very much to uh, supply in, in Dubai. It's moving that way in Abu Dhabi as well, but, but our, we've also got growing demand. And we're at a, a, a different time in the cycle, and we're also at a different volume level. So it's a, it's a, it's a different picture. Paul Bell, Samuel Ansari and Omar Bin Nani discussing tourism in the region there. Right, let's take a look at some other business stories in the news this week. 
Kuwait struck another blow to the Gulf's plans to push ahead with monetary union and a single currency this week. It has asked for the project to be delayed so it can address technical issues. Gulf countries, which include Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Qatar, plan to bring in a single currency in 2010. But the United Arab Emirates and Oman have already pulled out of the project. Qatar Airways completed the world's first commercial passenger flight powered by fuel made from natural gas this week. The flight was from London to Doha and the fuel was developed and produced by Shell. This offers airlines the chance to diversify away from oil-based aviation fuel. Iran's parliament has backed a controversial move to cut fuel subsidies. Iran's motorists currently enjoy some of the cheapest petrol in the world and around a third of the country's income is paid out in subsidies. The government wants to use the money it saves to help low-income families. Well, our time's nearly up, but before we go, let's find out what Ben's going to be doing in Turkey next week. In a week when Turkey and Armenia put aside their century-long dispute, I'm here in Istanbul finding out what all this means for business. I'll also be travelling east to Turkey's border with Armenia to find out what people there stand to gain. Will the reopening of the border simply mean a flood of cheap labour into Turkey or provide new trade opportunities? And for Armenians, will it provide the much-needed access to Europe that they so desperately crave? And of course, what does all this mean for the region's energy sector? Will the gas pipeline that's currently detouring through neighbouring countries now be able to pass through Armenia? So for a special report, join us here on the programme next week. Our time's up for this week. Before we go, though, let's take a quick look at how the region's major markets finished. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. But for now, for me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.